Hi, welcome. Um, so this is cross-dimensional careers, transitioning from front end to back end. Uh, my name is Jen. I work on the Node.js platform team at Netflix, uh, and I spent about nine years specializing in front end before switching to back end and tooling. Hi, and I'm Wes, uh, also on the Node.js platform team at Netflix. Uh, I spent four years about uh, learning just to absolutely hate browsers. I basically spent the rest of my career learning to hate all the other computers. <laughs> And of course, uh, the reason that we mention our years uh, in different specializations is because that's what this talk is about, transitioning from front end to back end, and like kind of actually somewhere in the middle, which we'll talk about. Um, but to give you an idea of what we're covering today, we're gonna be hitting on four major sections. So why we switched? Um, did we accidentally end up in this new domain, or was it a conscious choice, and why? Uh, how that went for us. Uh, transitions are really tricky. Um, and we're gonna talk about what we found going into this, uh, how it actually happened, and if our expectations uh, met the realities. And then what's the same? So what are the commonalities uh, between front end and back end? Uh, what knowledge in front end is also going to apply to back end? And then obviously what's different? Uh, what does not translate between the two uh, areas that you would need to learn if you want to do the transition? Uh, but before we start, a disclaimer. Uh, your mileage may vary. Uh, there is no one true way to transition from one domain to the next. Uh, so Wes and I are going to be talking about our individual experiences, and we're going to hit on topics and points that we think like translate despite how you get from point A to point B. Um, but if you're looking to transition yourself, uh, we are actually not providing a roadmap. Uh, just an idea of what you might experience along the way. Um, and to that point, we want to make sure to provide some definitions. Um, because when we say front end, uh, we are specifically talking about web-based JavaScript, and we are not talking about mobile or native applications. And when we talk about back end, uh, we're specifically, again, going to talk about JavaScript-based servers, runtimes, observability, things like that. Uh, we're not going to include things like database, data pipelines, batch jobs. Uh, back end can mean a lot of different things. Uh, so we want to make sure we're working with the narrow definition that we can speak to directly from our experience. OK, so with that said, um, why you might want to make the leap um, from front end to back end, and this is more from my perspective, um, and these aren't going to be true of everyone, uh, but I know that when I started uh, in software engineering and I was specializing in front end, um, I often thought that I needed to learn back end to be a real engineer. Um, so to be clear, a front end engineer is an engineer, uh, but at the time that I was like teaching myself JavaScript, I heard a lot of negative comments about front end not being hard enough. And that definitely influenced me. Um, now that I've been in the field for longer, um, I really feel like each domain has its easy parts and its hard parts, and some engineers just prefer some domains, and that's really like it. I don't really assign worth based off of what domain you work in. Um, so if this happens to be your motivation, I would really urge you to find a better one. Um, or maybe uh, one of those reasons is that you would like to make more money. Um, so there is a pay disparity uh, between front end and back end. Uh, you will be paid more for full stack and back end roles. Um, I've heard from recruiters that the gap here is closing, but it does still exist. Um, and this is like a fine reason to switch in my opinion. And another really good reason is boredom. Uh, so you can start out in one domain really enjoying it. Uh, everything is new and exciting, and then years go by, and you might notice that the problems that you're solving are actually, they're not that new, you've seen them before. Um, making a domain switch is a really great way to combat boredom or stagnation in your career. It's actually why I switched, um, though it took me a while to make the actual switch. Um, so I started working in uh, software engineering in front end uh, in 2012, and then I just continued working in front end for around eight years. And in 2020, I started working in open source. Uh, I was joining the Apollo client team at Apollo GraphQL. 
Um, so that is not classic front end. It's a little bit further away from it, but it, it still was not back end. Uh, and then in 2021, I joined the Node.js platform team at Netflix. And this is when I officially switched domains. Um, I still work with JavaScript, but I do not write front end code in this role. And uh, looking at this timeline, uh, you might think that I decided to switch domains around 2020, maybe 2021, um, but I actually want to make the switch like way earlier than that. Uh, so this is a more accurate timeline. Um, so about halfway through my career in classic front end, uh, I started getting like a bit bored. Um, and I wanted to learn more about backend. That seemed like a really accessible like domain for me to try out, to see how I liked it. Um, but you can tell I didn't do that transition for a very long time, and there were some very good reasons why. Um, even if the switch is intentional, it can take you a while to make the actual switch. So one of the reasons is that the path forward is really not clear. Um, even if you want to move in a certain direction, Orienting yourself without a map is hard, and there is no map for domain switching. Uh, so you take steps forward, you see if that's like the right path or not, maybe you have to go back and start and try again. Like so many times I tried different things to switch. I tried taking on roles in startups where I thought I could wear many different hats and maybe they'd allow me to do some more backend and I'd learn backend there. Um, I tried applying for full stack roles, um, but like these didn't work out. Um, the startups that I worked for kind of inevitably needed me to stick with front end. They didn't have a lot of people and they need someone to do front end. They didn't want me taking time away from that to learn a new domain. And then the full stack roles really ended up being back end roles with like a little side of front end. Um, and I, so I just wasn't a good fit for those at all. Also front end moves fast. Uh, I could barely keep my head above water learning front end, and I worried that if I focused on back end, I would fall behind in front end. Uh, I was not sure that I 100% wanted to make this switch. I wanted to try out back end, but in order to do that, I would have had to stop the learning I was doing in front end, and I really worried about falling behind. So I actually ended up deciding to stay in front end, but move around within that domain. Um, around 2018, 2019, I started moving towards front-end architecture. I really liked front-end systems. I decided I really liked tooling. I liked working with making front-end systems easier to work with. And around that time, I also started exploring open source. So I started learning a lot of the inner workings of React, for instance, and other libraries. And then in 2020 is when I joined the Apollo client team to actually work in open source full time, again, front end, but not classic front end and still JavaScript. And of all the ways that I tried to switch into back end, staying in front end, but moving towards tooling is actually what worked for me. Uh, it gave me a really good perspective. I was able to step away from UI and make sure that I liked that. I actually, I loved it. I loved not working with UI anymore. When I left Apollo, I decided to make a really intentional switch into like tooling and productivity. And I thankfully landed on the Node.js platform team at Netflix, uh, where my tooling, uh, my work is like tooling and, and backend. Uh, I really, really love it. Um, the takeaway I think from like how I did this switch is that you can actually move around in the domain that you're in uh, to decide if that's a good path forward for you. And speaking of which, uh, now I'll share a little bit of my story, which is all about moving around within both domains, front end and back end. Um, maybe I'll switch sides with you there. I'm going to drop this mic. I don't know if that's loud enough. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, when I got started, it was mostly like freelance, uh, WordPress stuff. Uh, I was working alone. There's not really a definition of front end and back end when you're working alone. You just solve the problems, right? Uh, it was a good start. But then in 2011, I went and found my first, uh, what I would call real job as a developer. Um, I was applying with just a portfolio and an art degree. Uh, that was pretty much instantly put me in a bucket, a front end engineer. Uh, so like the job was really just like cutting up Photoshop stuff into HTML, CSS, email templates, that kind of stuff. 
what I learned from that was that I was in this bucket. I didn't know that it existed before. Uh, and most of the actual like interactive UI stuff was working, uh, like these JavaScript widgets and stuff at the time, lots of jQuery prototype stuff, um, was given to people with more traditional software engineering backgrounds, um, which I didn't have. Uh, so then around 2013, I took a role at an agency. Um, the projects got assigned with a front end and a back end engineer. Uh, I was very lucky that this company hired a ton of great people. Um, and so I was working with a lot of great back end engineers partnering on projects. Uh, and this is one of my first encounters with the concept of building your network. Um, I made friends with these folks. And, and the other thing that I learned there that is critical is ask your coworkers and your friends at your job to help you learn. So I just asked them, hey, I, I'm, we're working together. Help me, walk me through what you're doing. Um, I also learned uh, from that that I just liked the work. Um, so I did the other thing that I think I would recommend to everybody, which is ask, ask for the work. So uh, what I did is I went to the, the, the leadership there and I said, hey, uh, on the next project, it's kind of small. Uh, maybe I can do both, right? Um, so that was full stack. Um, from 2015 to 2018 is where I really solidified my full stack uh, skill set. So I moved to a startup, which did give me the opportunity to wear many hats. Uh, as we were talking here, there's quite a bit of uh, different experiences here that we're sharing. Um, so for me, it, it did actually give me that opportunity. Uh, the startup had a pretty standard split between UI and API teams. Um, so I started on the UI. They were in the process of doing a switch to an Angular app with a Go server um, that served like the initial HTML. Um, it was pretty quick when I joined that team that the engineer who was the primary author of the Go server left the team. Uh, I took that role on and basically, uh, if you've ever worked on front-end teams, you'll often find that uh, those engineers probably are not super comfortable writing Go. Um, so that turned out to be the case. Uh, Go templates were pretty foreign to them. Uh, honestly, I would say probably pretty ill-suited for a UI team owning the server. Um, so what I did is I did the work no one else wanted to do. Uh, anytime there was a change that needed to happen in the Go server, I was the one that my team would come to and ask me to do it. So if you're looking to learn these kind of things, sometimes you just need to do the work no one else on your team wants to do. Um, similar to that, you uh, can also try to do the work that nobody realized that needed to be done or asked you to do. Um, so at the same startup, we had a local dev server. Uh, each team member, when they were onboarded, we had to build a new dev server. The process was owned by some other folks. It was like a chef thing that was just all complicated. Uh, and it would take like a week because it was like a whole other company. So we were getting pretty sick of this. So I said, hey, uh, maybe I can figure that out. Uh, so I started figuring out how to build the local dev server and onboard new team members. I was now a DevOps engineer. Okay, uh, so I've gotten us through quite a bit, but I want to backtrack and I want to talk about how I built out a lot of this uh, full stack skill set. And uh, the key was open source. So I started off back in about 2012. I had tons of little jQuery widgets and stuff like that. Um, and I made a whole ton of toy projects just to figure out what I liked doing. Um, so my first move into what I would call now uh, productivity engineering was actually a yeoman generator, uh, generated WordPress sites. Uh, I built it because I thought that my company might be able to use it. So I was going to hopefully convince them. Never worked. Left there. Um, <laughs> but most of these toy projects really uh, were mirroring my work. And honestly, they're probably not worth talking about except for two. Uh, Express being the first one. Uh, if you're in this room, I hope you've probably heard of that project. I got deeply invested, and that was a great way for me to learn the HTTP stack, um, JavaScript on the server. Uh, it, being ex having that experience in open source was really critical to me building out those skill sets. Uh, and then a very small one on the opposite end uh, called Node apt get. Uh, when I was doing that stuff, provisioning the local dev server for the team, I was sick of the chef thing. Um, so I tried, ah, let's write it in Node, right? Of course. Uh, so I wrote this Node Epcot thing. That turned out to be super fortuitous for me uh, because a team at Netflix was building IoT devices with Node for testing TVs and other streaming devices uh, and doing automation with that. So a recruiter found that, the, the team found they were using that module, found me, reached out, um, and here we are today. So I will go back a little bit to the, the main timeline here. Uh, 
that team was not a good fit because I was not that low in the stack. Uh, it was absolutely, uh, you know, pretty low level backend engineering. And at the time I was more of a full stack engineer. Luckily there was a, a team, adjacent team that was doing React and, and Node.js. Uh, I came in thinking I was more of a front end person because that was my background. Uh, I quickly got feedback from my team that they actually all thought of me as more of a backend engineer. So that was actually when I realized I was a backend engineer, uh, even though I didn't really intend it. Uh, so just to wrap it up and, and put a bow on it, uh, then I joined the build team. Uh, it lined a lot with my tooling and my productivity engineering, uh, you know, enjoyment. Uh, and now I'm on the Node.js platform team. So my whys, uh, and I'm following here on, after sharing my, my story, because really, honestly, I didn't have a why. It was just to solve a problem at the time. Uh, I really wanted to understand the things that were going on in my applications and around the, the UI bits, so I learned it. Uh, and honestly, in the end of the day, front end got really hard at some point. The tools that everybody was choosing, all the different changes in front end, the speed of it, just, it became something I didn't really care about continuing to learn with the, the you know, the amount of effort that it was involved. Okay, so um, now that Wes and I are both working in this tooling backend kind of hybrid space. Uh, we're going to talk about how our expectations uh, compared to the reality. Uh, so when you move into a new domain, you inevitably are going to find that some expectations actually match and some don't. So I had the expectation that there would just be a large skill set jump. Um, Honestly, uh, the reality was that I took a lot of little steps. So for me, starting new roles, I had at least a partial coverage of the skill set that I needed. Uh, and the nice thing for me was that I didn't actually have a lot of expectations going in. Um, I had written APIs, I had written some database schemas, I had you know, done these things just a little bit. So I actually had some of that skill when I started the role where it was actually expected of me. And I, I did a different kind of leap. Uh, Wes obviously did more small steps. I did a bigger jump. Um, and so one of my expectations was that I could learn back end the same way that I learned front end, which was mostly by myself with no mentorship, uh, watching materials like front end masters and attending front end conferences. And there is a lot of material to learn front end. If you're a beginner, intermediate, advanced, there is tons of material. I did not find that true to be like of back end at all. Um, in particular, there are less resources for intermediate and advanced learners. Um, it's super easy to find resources for making your first API with Node, and then what? Um, a lot of the advanced material assumes uh, knowledge or vocabulary that I didn't have, uh, or it's written in languages that I didn't know. Um, also, I would ask people in backend, how did you learn this? And almost always the answer was on the job. Um, also, don't get me started on Googling. Uh, Googling is kind of useless when you're trying to look up backend terms that you don't really understand. And so I had a lot of trouble learning on my own like I had done with front end. Uh, I do want to share, though, two books that were actually really, really useful for me. Uh, Mastering API Architecture. This explained a lot of concepts to me that I was unfamiliar with, like gateways and the history of them. Uh, and then Distributed Systems with Node.js. This is one of the few resources that are really good for learning about distributed systems in a language that you might be more familiar with. These books were actually really helpful. But other than this, I've really had to rely on my coworkers and learning on the job. And so I expected backend to mean writing API endpoints. But the reality is backend can mean a lot of things, just like frontend can. Tech stacks are deep, they're varied. Uh, for me, that felt really freeing. Uh, as I was making the transition, you know, the UI space was consolidating more on the React Webpack tooling. That felt pretty restricting. Uh, making the switch fully more into the backend realm really felt a lot more open-ended. And uh, sometimes you don't know what to expect. I knew from being a front-end engineer that backend engineers were giving me APIs, but I really did not have a good understanding of what their day-to-day -day looked like. So I asked like a backend engineer that I'm friends with, like, what are you doing? Like, literally, what are you doing today? And he said, I'm trying to make that line look like that other line. 
Um, so he made a change, he deployed it, and now he was watching the metrics to see if it matched what it was supposed to be doing. And yeah, this is true. Um, I did this recently for my job. I had to roll out a change. I had to watch the metrics and I had to make the line look like the other line. So this one actually really did match. Um, I also had this expectation that a lot of my front end skills weren't going to translate to back end. And the truth is actually that you have a lot more skills that will transfer than you think. And that's because Honestly, software is software. It doesn't really matter what the code does, what language it's in, what the environment is. Some things are pretty much always going to be the same. Uh, you're not going to be starting from square one on this. Uh, so let's talk about some things that will help. Uh, nailing your fundamentals. This is key. Things like design principles, security best practices, general craftspersonship things. Um, so one of the things I really loved was uh, Adi Asmani's design principles in JS. Uh, seeing those patterns in a language that I was familiar with really helped me understand them. Uh, and since I was not traditionally trained, I hadn't been exposed to things like Gang of Four principles earlier in my career. Um, for security best practices, it's a little bit harder, I think. Um, keeping up with things as they're ongoing can be tough. I think my strongest recommendation for folks interested in this area is get in a little bit over your head, especially when it's non-critical issues. Uh, you'll learn from that, and that is learning on the job, uh, but I think if you try to do it in, in, and work with team members uh, who have a little bit more experience in that area, you can, you can pick up things as you go. And lastly, the crafts part is really just things like attention to detail, error handling, formatting of your code, consistency in how you design your applications, stuff like that. Uh, those spending time learning those skills will, will definitely pay off. Um, so JavaScript, obviously, uh, we have a wonderful Node.js uh, server runtime. Learning JavaScript and anything about it uh, is a critical technology bridge for you uh, across this gap. Uh, anything you learn about ECMAScript, VMs they run in, V8 Spider Monkey stuff, that all will pay off, uh, both on the front end and the back end. And this is true even if you're writing TypeScript. TypeScript is JavaScript when it actually runs. Um, so, and actually, even, the, even broader, uh, even if you're doing something that doesn't run on a JS uh, virtual machine, you'll find that there are parallels across these uh, things with concepts that you can apply. Uh, they're usually just like one step lower in the stack than you. So these are things that you can understand uh, and, and transfer as you transfer the skill sets. Also, uh, I think this is just one of the most important skills you can focus on that works, uh, whether you're working in software or just talking about your general life. Uh, time spent working on how you communicate, uh, especially communicate your technical work, how you bring your friends, colleagues, bosses, customers along on those journeys, um, especially uh, when you're working on projects. And I, and I think how you write and speak will always be time well spent. So let's talk a little bit more about some technical stuff. Uh, all crafts people need a good set of tools. So what are those tools that are gonna be transferable from your front end to back end experience? Git, uh, it's one of these things we all rely on every day, but most of us barely scratch the surface. Uh, as far as managing your source files go, I promise you it can do anything you ask of it. Uh, there's actually so much that you could probably spend the next year learning these things, and you'll probably never use them. So I would recommend taking it slow. Learn things as you need them. When you find an issue, Google around, and your mileage may vary, but Google around uh, for Git uh, help on, on those kind of things, because you will almost always find something. Uh, and, and similarly to how I mentioned learn, take it slow learning Git, there are so many tools out there. Uh, less really is more. Uh, don't feel the need to know them all, uh, and especially don't feel the need to use them all. <laughs> That's bad. Uh, start small, work your way out. Uh, the two things you're obviously going to need, which you also needed on the front end, were an editor and a terminal. Uh, there might be extensions and things that you find that will help you uh, as you as you jump across uh, from the front end. But but actually, most of them will also probably be the same. And lastly here, uh, take notes and write scripts, especially when you're joining larger teams or companies that have really complicated things. Uh, learning deeply about each tool is is probably not gonna be time well spent for you. Uh, pick and choose. Uh, and then what I always recommend is take notes. Uh, if you hit a complicated task, take your notes on it. If you hit it again, add to your notes. If you hit it a third time, script it. And so you're probably saying, how is this a tool? Bash. 
absolutely <laughs> learn some bash uh, it's a tool you almost always need to get that last mile even if you don't actually have to write it front end or back end there is always a load bearing bash script in your stack everything i've ever worked on has one uh, you also can transfer a lot of your knowledge about debugging seems like it might not be true between front end and back end but it absolutely is uh, so up and to the right this is usually a bad thing um, not always, but it usually is a bad thing. Um, so things like memory leaks and CPU issues look pretty similar actually in the browser or the server. And debugging memory leaks in particular is a skill that I learned in the browser that has been really valuable on the server. Uh, you're also gonna still use console.log a lot. Like you're gonna log a lot of things. Um, so like log as much as you want on all your things when you hit a new issue like add logs debug them so on and so forth it's going to be really helpful for you wes has a particular point about logging that uh if you want to know more about ask him during the qa it has to do with log levels and what he thinks you should actually be using for a logger in everything not console log <laughs> not console log um and there are good reasons for it but ask him about it later um, and then lastly, for debugging, uh, the best skill that I have ever picked up is breaking down large problems into small ones. This will be true no matter your domain. You will have a large problem and you will have to break it down. You will think horses, not zebras. And you will work your way from one step and slowly break down the problem. So this absolutely transfers. If you're learning debugging in one thing, you can take all of these skills and apply it to a new domain, like no matter the domain. OK. Uh, what connects the server and the client? Obviously, HTTP. The bridge has two sides. Understanding from one side is absolutely going to help you on the other. Uh, things like headers, status codes, paths, all that translates. And understanding the user experience is a skill you absolutely want to keep sharp. Uh, knowing what your consumers of your APIs are going to like and hate is something that you can bring from the front end into the back end. OK, and then talking about, you know, we talked about what actually would transfer. What is different? What actually won't transfer? Um, Performance. Performance is very different on front end and back end. When I was working in front end, I was very concerned with things like time to paint, the size of my assets, images, bundle size, and then optimizing for a device. It could be running in a browser on a laptop or it could be running in a mobile device. Those were my concerns. And one of the largest differences you need to think about here is because of concurrency and parallelism. Uh, in the browser, it's likely that a bug might impact just the one user. On the server, that same type of bug could cause the server to crash and take out all the parallel requests that are happening at that time. Uh, additionally, scaling is not really a thing, at least not the way we think about it on the server side. Uh, the more concurrent users your applications have, the more your server side needs to scale. So things like systems architecture, distributed systems, horizontal versus versatile, vertical scaling, auto scaling policies, stuff like that all becomes really important to understand. Uh, and lastly here, latency. So similar to uh, time to paint, uh, having a response and uh, with a, having a responsive UI in the browser, server-side uh, server latency is, is really a critical measurement here. It actually oftentimes ties directly into the UI responsiveness. Um, so it's likely you already have a bit of a familiarity with the concept, but the details of how latency can affect system performance are quite different on the back end, specifically because of the parallelism, right? Two things going on at once, some extra latency in one might back up the whole system. And also very, very different is observability. Uh, this is much more of a thing on the back end than the front end. So the front end, you get visual like clues. Uh, if there's a bug, you can screenshot it. You can video it. When customers report a UI bug, in my experience of all the years I was in front end, they were mostly reproducible. Uh, without observability, though, on the back end, you are flying blind. And that's why we have metrics. And yes, the front end can collect metrics, but those are usually product metrics, and there's not as many of them. Uh, for back end, you're looking at system metrics, and you're looking at a lot of them. Uh, there's also tracing. Uh, I have never worked with this concept in front end. It wasn't a thing. Uh, but because back end, you're dealing with a system calling another system, this is very helpful for you to trace what's going on. 
Uh, and you're also going to have to learn all of the vocabulary for observability. A span in front end and a span in back end are not the same thing. Uh, and then also on the observability side, logging, which you might be like, wait, but you just talked about console.log, so this is the same thing, right? Uh, no. Um, so in the front end, when you're logging, uh, you're using one user session and you know where the logs are coming from. Uh, logging on the back end is actually aggregate logging from multiple servers at one time, and you're looking through those logs to try and figure out what happened, but it's not as easy to look through them and say, oh, this happened sequentially and on one server. Uh, the other thing is while you can log everything that you want uh, in the back end and also with metrics and tracing, there are performance costs to doing it. So the observability itself could be a performance issue, and so you have to learn about why that is on that side of things. And then uh, you're like, oh, this is a lot to learn. It's cool. You can forget some things, which is my favorite part. So when you make this switch, there's like space that you can like free up in your brain. You don't have to think about these things anymore. Like UI frameworks, you can just forget about them. Um, <laughs> I worked with React for a really long time. I, I loved working with it. I kind of remember certain things about it, but I've mostly forgotten. Um, and if that appeals to you, back end might be for you. Um, you don't have to worry about browser compatibility anymore, so you can free up your brain on that. You no longer have to check out what you were making in multiple different browsers or go check the documentation to see who implemented what feature and how or if it's different. Uh, so that also frees up some space. Um, and then CSS, um, which I'm sure many of you will be happy to hear. Uh, I actually liked working with CSS, but I, I have forgotten so much of it. Um, so yeah, you can free up some space when you make this. You don't have to like keep all these things in your head all at once. So uh, we covered a lot. Uh, we're going to hang out up here for Q&A uh, if anybody wants to come up and talk with us. Uh, we recognize this transition can be pretty hard and it can take a really long time. So we wanted to leave you with a note from one of my daughter's books, uh, Vampirina Ballerina. And that is, it doesn't matter if you take one giant leap or many tiny steps as long as you're moving toward your goal. So thank you. We were going to do an official Q&A. We figured people could just come chill. So yeah, come, come talk to us if you yeah. have questions. <laughs> Otherwise, you're, you're free to go. <laughs>